First, when people, when churches, uh, when cultural and mainstream Christianity condemns LGBT people, what they tend to do is to appeal or to draw on or to rely on singular interpretations of the Bible to justify their disapproval of queer people. The act of using the Bible for this means is called textual harassment or Bible bashing. So you get this idea of people bashing people and hit the Bible, right? And the parts of the Bible that are used for this purpose, for this purpose are called clobber passages. Again, clobber. Now, they are primary clobber passages, but they are also secondary clobber passages. Primary clobber passages are biblical passages that are often regarded as refer referring explicitly to same-sex behavior. I think a lot of us are familiar with these uh, passages. I just want to highlight Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 28, which recount the story of the men of Sodom, yes, thing, who purportedly wanted to have sex with the angels, who visited Lot. And this text has been used as the text against same-sex behavior. Hence, you get the term sodomy. Right? Secondary clobber passages are commonly understood as making implicit references, either to same-sex behavior, or they uphold the sole validity of opposite-sex behavior. These interpretations constantly create a feeling of, among queer people that they are going against God and the Bible. Are they really? I'll we'll look at that in a while. Oh. The second appeal, and this is another strategy used by mainstream and cultural Christianity, is the appeal to spiritualistic dualism. Spiritualistic dualism, in simple words, um, or in other words, according to James Nelson, means that traditional Christian theology understands the body as less important than the soul, the spirit, or the mind. It is colored by a strong sense of dualism. Now, um, Wati Longcha describes dualism by giving the example of a binary. So you get the able, disabled, holy, unholy, soul, body, permanent, temporal, man, woman, human, non-human, spirit, matter, living, non-living beings example. It's almost like, the, it's, it's, it's sort of saying that reality must, can only be seen in terms of either this or that. That's what dualism is all about. A human person is no longer understood as what Nelson calls a body-self unity, right? but a soul trapped in a body. And I thought it was quite ironic that the theme of Ilga Asia 2020 was independent bodies and, and souls. Right? Again, that dualism that we are bodies and souls instead of being people or lives. The body is thus considered a site of temptation and sinfulness. What becomes more important is the soul, which must strive towards eternal salvation, be ye saved. Spiritualistic dualism creates the feeling that the soul understood as the church and God, and the body, understood as being gay or in any way or having HIV, have little to do with each other. And it also creates the feeling that the soul should be taken care of more than the body. The third strategy is an appeal to heteronormative theology and ethics of sex. Now, again, I quote from Long Cha, Long Cha says that theology is God talk, or a discourse, or discussion on God. Heteronormative theology and ethics in sex is based on the belief that the only valid and divinely approved form of sex is non-adventurous vanilla sex between two people of the opposite sex who are sexually monogamous, deeply loving, in a long-term official commitment, and who have sex for the purpose of reproduction. Anything else is wrong, <laughs> right? So of course that leaves the rest of us out of the picture. People who disapprove of same-sex behavior, um, now I think before I, I continue, I just want to say that it's important to understand heteronormativity not as heterosexuality, because heteronormity refers to a particular type of heterosexuality, so a lot of straight people are also condemned by those who think that 
the heteronormative way of having sex is the only way of having sex. So that's quite important as well. So it's not just the straights versus the LGBTs, it's not like that. It's, it's this whole ideology, this whole idea that you can only have one kind of valid sex, right? But at the same time, heteronormative ideas in, the, in, in theology and ethics also appeal to ideas that have been put, have been put forward by two main theolo theologians. First, the 4th century theologian Augustine of Hippo, and then the 13th century theologian uh, Thomas Aquinas. I'm not familiar with, uh, with or any one of you actually, most of you, and I'm not sure um, what your grasp of theology is, but uh, for those who may not be initiated into the idea of theology, these two men, Augustine and Thomas, are people who have said things about God that have influenced Christians to this day. So we're talking about men from the 4th century, men from the 13th century, who think they know everything about God, and they've said things that have been accepted by churches right until this day, especially things about sex. Now, but we have to know where they come from. As um, Augustine of Hippo was somebody who struggled with sex. And he supported the idea that to abstain from sex and remain unmarried was the ideal situation for Christians. Nevertheless, marriage could also be good because it provided a legitimate means for men and women to express their lust and have children. Aquinas saw sex as legitimate only between a man and a woman within marriage and for the purpose of producing children. And for him, homosexuality sort of interrupts this natural flow of marriage and children, which is part of this divine law. These two theologians have influenced Christianity uh, right through the ages into determining what is right sex and what is wrong sex. Now, for instance, many churches, Christian churches in Asia, in Oceania, in the Pacific, are deeply opposed to uh, same-sex behaviors as a, as a result of the influence of these two men. And in many of our countries in South, Southeast and East Asia, Roman Catholicism is particularly influential. And Roman Catholicism for some reason, makes an odd distinction, get this, makes an odd distinction between homosexual tendencies and homosexual acts. It, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church considers homosexual tendencies as not sinful, but somehow disordered, and homosexual sex as extremely sinful. And Roman Catholicism considers homosexual inclinations as a trial, right, we talked about that, and exhorts people who have homosexual inclinations take on chastity, which is actually a very thin guise for celibacy. So if you're gay, it's fine, but you can't have sex. And many queer people who try to follow the teachings of the church are thus led to believe that if they don't do what the church says, they're going against a divinely ordained naturalness. Whatever that means. Fourth, there is this appeal to notions of prohibition and punishment. Now, there are mixed ideas uh, among global Christian communities that HIV and AIDS are forms of divine punishment. Mainstream Christianity, so those major churches, tend to shy away from connecting HIV and AIDS to ideas of punishment. For instance, the Anglican Communion, the primates, the leaders of the Anglican Communion, have declared openly that HIV and AIDS is not a punishment from God. And the Roman Catholic Church realized, uh, has stated that its organizations provide like 25% of all HIV treatment, care, and support throughout the world. But they have also declared a prohibition against condom usage, which has hampered the, uh, the efforts to curb the spread of HIV in countries that try to follow the teachings of the church. So they said, they said we, we go out, we will help people with HIV and AIDS, but you can't use condoms. So again, you see how mainstream Christianity tends to go along the lines of double speak. They say one thing and then they say something else in contradiction. Um, in, 20, in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI condemned condoms as increasing the spread of HIV. And then he amended his statement after that and suggested that condoms may be a responsible way of curbing HIV infections. But look, we're talking about Roman Catholics who have been indoctrinated for years and years with the idea that condoms are wrong in any and all circumstances. Many Roman Catholics, queer or otherwise, have felt that they're betraying and challenging the church 
and because they challenge the church and oppose the church, they're opposing God through condom usage. Cultural Christian communities, on the other hand, appear to be more inclined towards the idea that HIV is a punishment from God. Just a very quick example, in 1992, 36% of people in the United States believed that HIV and AIDS are, are forms of God's punishment for immoral behavior. And this dropped to 14% in 2003, but we're still talking about 44 million people. The belief that HIV and AIDS are gay diseases links people with same-sex attraction to HIV and AIDS. And in 2003, the then Vice President of Taiwan, Annette Lu, referred to HIV as the evidence of divine punishment for homosexuality. <laughs> no comment. But before, so, what you get, and yeah, I know where, you know, okay, to the land you are in, uh, but then you get people who believe that they deserve to get HIV, they deserve to be punished, and the punishment from God is just punishment. So, but it, we cannot have the idea, I mean, it would be a gross injustice to say that Christianity as a whole is overarchingly um, antagonistic towards um, LGBTQ people and access to sexual health care. Because it's, uh, I think, I think a simple allusion would be to look at Christianity as, as a knife. You can use it for good purposes, just as you can use it for non-good purposes. You know? um, so how do we look at Christianity from perspectives that can combat discrimination and encourage access to health care? I, I suggest that there are four ways of looking at Christianity that assist us in that direction. To look at the overarching message of Christianity, alternative interpretations of the Bible, queer theology, and affirming theologies of HIV and AIDS. So first, the idea that we can appeal to alternative interpretations of the Bible. Let's not forget that the Bible is a record of testimonies by ancient people on their experiences of God. And their experiences of God have sort of been enshrined in this book and have been further interpreted by Christians through the ages to this day. The Bible is time-specific. Readers interpret the Bible according to their own context. Therefore, there is no one singular overarching interpretation of the Bible. Everybody, every single person who reads the Bible interprets it according to his or her own way. So, might we not apply that to the clobber passages as well? For instance, scripture scholars suggest that the clobber passages can be interpreted as allusions, references to pederasty, sexual violence, pride, lack of hospitality to strangers, ritual impurity. Um, some, some say that the English translations are inaccurate. Um, some say that these are references to indulgence in sexual pleasure as ends in themselves, or signs of infidelity to God. Whatever the interpretation may be, you have this huge question mark there. The question of what really lay in the mind of the biblical authors remains a mystery. We will never really know what they were writing about. And because of that, the Bible cannot be used as a tool against LGBT queer people. Second, we can appeal to the overarching message of Christianity. I think it's really important for us to go back to the teachings of the founder of this movement, somebody called Jesus Christ. You may have heard of him. Um, and the core, the central message that this Christ proclaimed was love and non-judgment, which he not only taught but exemplified by his example and which was lived out by the early Christian communities. And it's also important that when we, when, you know, I find it very interesting that whenever we go back to the scriptures, go back to the gospels, we find Christ not just talking about your spirit and your soul, but also caring for people's bodies. And we've done a gross injustice by bringing spiritualistic dualism to break that unity of the human being. Even to the extent of saying spirits, uh, what do you call it? Bodies and souls. <laughs> Third, this is something probably that may not go down very well with a lot of people, and that's the idea of going, uh, appealing to queer theology. I'm ahead of myself, aren't I? Right. In contemporary times, uh, you get, a, uh, you see the emergence of a lot of contextual theologies. Now, contextual theologies are theologies 
that are constructed on the experiences of human lives rather than philosophical ideas. And some examples of constructive theologies include liberation theology, black theology, feminist theology, and then you have Asian theologies and queer theology. Queer theology has two approaches. First, it, it sort of foregrounds the experiences of queer people in conceptualizing theology of LGBTQ people who don't meet normative expectations. I'll finish up now by looking very quickly at affirming theologies of HIV and AIDS. The theology of HIV and AIDS is based on the Christian idea that Christ is the head and we are the body. And you, you get this idea that if, the body, if someone's body has HIV, then it makes sense that the person's head also has HIV. So if Christians have HIV, the body of Christ has HIV, then the head, Christ, also has HIV. And so you get this idea of the body of Christ having AIDS. The body of Christ is HIV ridden. So to reach out to people with HIV and AIDS is to reach out to Christ himself. So that's the basis, one of the basis of, of uh, the theology of HIV. Second, the idea of the body of Christ suggests that Christians everywhere are all interconnected. And if one member of the whole Christian body suffers, all parts of the body suffer. So we have this idea that when this, this, this idea sort of supports a further idea that if people reach out to other people who have HIV and AIDS, they are actually exemplifying and imitating the example of Christ who reach out to those who are marginalized. And lastly, the idea of the body of Christ invites people to see how those who are living with HIV and AIDS are bearers of God's mission. And this comes from the wisdom of Erlinda Centuri as a, Filipino, uh, a Filipina uh, um, a UCC member. And she says that HIV people are not to be pitied because they minister to us. People with HIV and AIDS are bearers of God's mission. And when they try to make meaning of their lives and appreciate life, they teach us how to appreciate life more deeply and purposefully. So, just to recap, just to recap, uh, recapitulate very quickly, you have strategies for, uh, against queer people, and you have strategies for queer people. Strategies against queer people appear in Christianity when they sort of appeal to singular interpretations of biblical passages, when they adopt spiritualistic dualism, when they appeal to heteronormative theology and ethics and sex, and when they promote notions of punishment and prohibition. On the other hand, Christianity can become a powerful force in support of people with HIV and LGBTQ people when they look at alternative interpretations of the Bible, the overarching message of Christianity, when they appeal to queer theology and affirm theologies of HIV and AIDS. Now stop here. I want to give you a little bit of, uh, I'm very focused on the context of Singapore and I'm going to share, because that's my experience and my base. And the current situation, the participation, the participation in supporting health services is quite limited in Singapore. Um, I mean, in terms of, especially towards HIV work. Okay? Um, there are, from my knowledge, there are only three main churches involved. My church, Free Community Church, FCC. Kampo Kampo Methodist Church, who organized a symposium on, uh, on during World Day to educate people on HIV and inv invited Dr. Um, Donald Messer over um, because he was a good friend um, of um, the Bishop Reverend, the retired Bishop Reverend Yam, um, who had collaborated on that. Then, um, City Harvest Church, which is very, which is you know, it's in the news lately because um, the, the pastor and several board members were, were convicted of, um, of misappropriating funds in the church. Um, they have a ministry uh, ministering to the HIV positive persons in CDC, the Communicative, uh, Communicatable Disease Center. Okay, that's what I am, these are the three churches that uh, I'm aware of. Other faith based organizations are involved. Um, a Buddhist group, Tsuji, I think we have Tsuji here as well. Tsuji came from, is from Taiwan. So um, we have Tsuji in Singapore who also provides support for HIV positive persons. 
now very quickly. Issues and concerns that I'm concerned about is that the support had been quite limited to charity, about money, providing financial support and distance without encountering the HIV positive persons. So that distance is still there, and the judgment, the seeing, seeing HIV as a, as a punishment is still persistent. It did not resolve the issues. Um, the volunteers at CDC from City Harvest from my impression, this is my impression, I must be, I, I want to say this is my perspective, they seem to be more concerned with deathbed conversions than the actual, you know, than, than the love for somebody. I think it's a form of love uh, because they are concerned with saving souls, right? Now, I must say, I feel, um, I myself find my own bias uh, a bit discomforting as well, because I see the work and the positive results of the work they do in ministry and, and um, providing spiritual care and, and care in general for these uh, patients at CDC. They actually provide massages and, and stuff. They really care for them. So while I may be a bit, I may, I may be concerned about their, their concern, they're trying to have that big conversions, I know that that is good that come out of the work they do. And I wonder, and I don't think that, I think that there might be, during the encounter with the patient, that they learn to really listen about the situations of their lives and change their minds about LGBT people or people who are living with HIV. Um, um, so that's one of the things. Now, there are also views that differentiate between innocent victims and those who make a lifestyle choice for example, gay men and sex workers, and reinforcing the understanding of divine punishment. They seem to have privileged uh, some, um, those who are innocent victims, and, and that's the, where they, they, they go towards. So, um, the strategies I think we need to do is to decouple access to health services from faith and cultural values and move towards justice, equality and love. Okay, uh, and theologically love and care for a person and not judging, you know, as um, Joseph has outlined in the first part, is critical. Um, and Singapore is a um, secular society. Christians form at most 15% of the population. That should not influence, and likewise in, in, in Taiwan, they do not form the majority. But they have a disproportionate amount of power political and otherwise and financial and that that is one area that we need to um, think about I also want to warn that Christianity is not monolithic it is not one Christianity the loudest voice represents a fringe our strategy should be learning from colonialism divide and conquer we divide them we identify those shrill, extreme, radical voices on one side and address the middle, um, silent majority. Address and point out the inconsistencies and with the teaching of love and the direct impact it has on human lives, LGBT lives in particular. Okay? Um, we have been doing advocacy behind closed doors. They can do the behind closed doors, so can we. Um, this works very well with the Ministry of Health. They approach us to be part of focus groups to discuss um, uh, issues that we are concerned with. And they implement policies. Um, unfortunately, we, the opposite happens for the Ministry of Education. Same as Taiwan. The, the religious right has infiltrated the Ministry of Education. Well, we um, because of because the people working in the Ministry of Health understand public health, they understand decriminalization is vital to um, education and prevention of uh, HIV and many other things. So this is the area that we work. Now, one of the things that we have done um, in the past was in the past five years, our prison services do not provide HIV uh, medications to prisoners. It has been, they have relied on um, religious organizations to go in to provide for the medication. 
Um, this is how our, our state runs, okay? A lot of the gaps are filled up by charitable organizations and largely faith-based ones. So Ziti went in to provide uh, medications for prisoners and we also collaborated with them. Ziti in Singapore is an institute of public character. Therefore, um, whatever they, they are, which means that if you donate to Ziti, you get tax re, uh, rebates, right? They, uh, so, but they are, they are scrutinized at a very, very um, uh, detailed level how they use the money. They can only use the money to fund Singapore citizens. So we went in to cover the difference. Um, so um, we supplied uh, medications to 19 women in prison. And when I found out 19 women, and I, okay, I have the bias thinking that HIV only affects gay men, right? I myself had that bias back then. I was like, 119 women. And I realized that these are most likely sex workers who have somehow uh, been caught or arrested for violating or for overstaying or whatnot and get in prison. Now, we started discussing with them, with the minister, you know, um, my uh, Bishop Yap has built up a relationship with them and then discussing with them like, you know, this cannot be. You provide medication for these folks for whatever other ailment they might suffer from. They might have TB, they might have other complications, you provide medication. But here, you do not provide the antiretroviral, which is stupid. If you provide the antiretroviral uh, medication, the HIV medications, then they would live a healthier life and they would not need all the other medica medications, which is more expensive. So there was some negotiation going on and they decided to start um, providing the services. Now this part I'm a bit, mm, I don't want to say too much because there's a part illegal, illegality on our part of what we've been We've been bringing um, from Thailand uh, uh, the generic HIV medication because we could do that. But when the state took over, they could not because of the uh, free trade agreement, they cannot use generics. So the cost was much, much higher than they anticipated. And so three days after, I think it was three days after they sent out an email, they said that that email was sent out in, uh, in error and they want to withdraw the email and, and requested that we continue supporting the prisons with medication. Uh, Reverend Yap said no. Uh, and it caused a lot of issues on our side because some of our folks who have been volunteering go, we cannot put people's lives at risk. But Reverend Yap's statement to them was, the blood is not on our hands, it's on their hands. And that pressure caused the government to, within two, three months, to pass through, I don't know how, I don't know from which budget, to support, to start supplying medication, and since then, they have supplied medication to all HIV positive persons in prison. That kind of work, we need to be very careful I, I struggle on the part where you know there's advocacy, but there's the individual lives that is at stake, and that balancing that is some something that I still try to learn. And then finally, the last one is we actually have a lifting of the travel ban um, of, of HIV positive persons to Singapore on the first of April 2015. This took years of negotiation, back uh, back door discussions, and pointing out this stupid. This makes us. It's embarrassing, right? We are supposed to first world country and here we are having this. Um, but when it was lifted, there was no announcement. Even I didn't know. And only, you know, later on one of my friends who wanted to travel to Singapore asked me and I checked uh, with one of my friends who was in the know all these things. It was, and that was only five months later that I found out that it was lifted. They did not do it with much funfair. This person works in within the health uh, Ministry of Health said that they do not want to create much fun, uh, much noise about this because it will create a backlash.